Should you listen to advice from other engineers and how much advice should you listen to? I don't think this topic is covered well on YouTube so that's the reason for this video. I'm going to go over what you should consider when taking advice and some of the problems of trying to listen to too much and why it may actually be hampering your development and career as a software engineer. Make sure you stick around until the end of the video and I'll leave you with some parting advice on my own strategy for managing this. And by the way if you're new to my channel I'm Imdad, a former software engineer that turned founder and CTO running my own AI company. My videos are a mix of teaching you how to code with my favorite language Python, but also giving you advice if you're thinking about becoming a software engineer or breaking into tech. Please do tap the like button and if you enjoyed this video, of course, you're more than welcome to subscribe. With that said, let's get started. When you're learning something new for the first time, you're in the phase of what I call discovery. You're getting your hands stuck into something that you've never done before, and because of this, you know nothing. The beginning phase is really just about trying to figure out more of what you don't know than what you already do. And really, it's just a matter of scoping out the subject and figuring out the right questions to ask. Let's take coding as an example. One of the most common questions that I get on TikTok and Instagram in my comments and DMs is often, what is the best programming language that I should learn? I'm telling you, this question is so popular and I don't think it will ever not be. But don't get me wrong, I understand. Programming and software engineering can feel alien when you're first getting started. And it won't be long before you discover that programming languages are the building blocks of software. But the issue is that there's hundreds that exist. And of course, to write programs, you need to learn at least one of these languages. But as you can imagine, especially if you're already a programmer, the challenge is that there's so many. So the question naturally is for a beginner, which one should they learn? It's a legitimate question and this is where it gets interesting, particularly what a beginner chooses to do next. Naturally, the first thing that you would typically do if you're trying to answer this question is ask a friend who is a software engineer. But of course, if you don't have that friend, you'd do what everyone else does. And that is to go on YouTube and type this question and search for videos. You'll see hundreds of results. And before you know, you've clicked on a few and all of a sudden you're instantly flooded with a dozen videos giving you all of this new information. In these videos, you're learning so much about what programming languages there are, what they're used for, and why some languages are better than others in certain contexts. And before you know it, you've spent hours watching all of these videos, learning about these popular languages, what they do and what they don't do, and what they're used for and why you might use one over the other. And naturally, you continue to watch videos because you feel like you're making progress and you're working towards an answer to this question. Before you know it, you've spent an entire week or even more than a month watching all these different videos to try and get the right answer. But of course, from all of this, you can probably already identify what the issue is and you've probably even experienced this yourself. At this point, all you've done is researching and you haven't written a single line of code. And what I've seen so many people do, not just beginners and not just in software, engineering is that they get stuck in this discovery phase. They're spending so much time researching even though they've already got a suitable answer for the question. But because of the influx of all of this new information, all of these new concepts and perspectives, they feel like that isn't enough or the answer that they got wasn't enough or the right one. They become so overwhelmed and they're not actually sure how or where to get started. And the problem is they never get out of this phase and they've got to a point because of the lack of time that they haven't actually landed on an answer and they haven't actually made progress. Or in some cases, Cases, they've done so much researching that they've got to a point where they're answering this question for others, even though they haven't themselves programmed in that language or haven't actually gone through the process of building software. And at this point, they're essentially stuck in the discovery phase where they're facing this dilemma and where they're experiencing what I call the paradox of choice. Actually, it wasn't me that came up with it. It was by a psychologist named Barry Schwartz. Essentially, the paradox of choice is this idea that the more options that we have, the more overwhelmed we become and the harder it is to make a decision. And because because we're surrounded by so much choice, the less likely it is that we will make a decision. One of the best things that you can ever do for your learning, career and development is this one thing that I've learned over 20 years of writing code and of course now building my own company. And that is very simply to reduce your inputs and to learn to ignore the noise. Sam Altman, founder of OpenAI, and of course we know him to be the creator of ChatGPT, in an interview with Lex Friedman said something pretty incredible. And it's something that really hit home for me and it stuck with me for the longest time. And this piece of advice ironically helped me to focus and actually lose more than 30 kilos. I'm not going to talk about that in this video, but listen to this clip. And I think I mostly got what I wanted by ignoring advice. <laughs> and I think like yeah. I tell people not to listen to too much advice. Listening to advice from other people should be approached with great caution. You heard that right. He got what he wanted by learning to ignore advice. 
But before you shout out the screen, he goes on to clarify this a bit further. Now you're probably thinking, why should I listen to you if you're playing a video telling me to not listen to advice? But I want you to focus on the wording. What he's saying is that people listen to too much advice. And this is where the issue arises. And quite frankly, I think this is a trap. The biggest mistake that I see people make is that they spend too much time researching and listening to advice and spending less time on acting on even some of it. The internet is rich with more data and information than ever. And although that means that we're spending more time on social media or on our phones, it isn't always a bad thing. If you were a software engineer a decade ago and you were preparing for a big tech interview, your best option was to pick up the book Cracking the Coding Interview. I've gone through this book myself and I've even recommended it to others. This was many years ago, but it definitely was a very good resource and it was pretty viral at the time. But more importantly, it was probably the only resource around, or at least it was the one that everyone was recommending. But fast track to today and that has completely changed. Nowadays you have so many different sources for learning data structures and algorithms and preparing for a big tech interview. Dedicated websites for coding challenges, online university courses that are completely free, courses created by engineers who are working at these big tech companies. There are so many resources and the list goes on. But with this increase in the number of resources, so has the increase come in the number of suggestions, opinions and perspectives. Everyone these days is offering advice. And in some cases, you find that some people are trying to also force it through. And in some cases, it's created quite a toxic environment where some people even go as far to harshly call out other people for sharing advice that is different to theirs. But overall, it gets to the point where I think there is too much advice. And the best thing that you can do in this scenario is to reduce how much advice that you're consuming and minimizing the advice that you're actually taking on board. Now at this point you're probably saying well Imdad you've talked about in this video about not listening to advice but you're asking me to listen to you and yes that is the case but hear me out. What I'm going to do is give you my strategy that's worked for me and combats this notion of advice overload. In the scenario where you're trying to figure out an answer to a question, let's take that example of earlier in the video when I talked about how people often ask me the best first programming language to learn. Let's say you're asking that question. This is my mental model that's going to help you avoid that scenario of advice overload. And it's very simple. All you need to do is if you're in the scenario where you're asking this question or a question like it, what you want to do is time box and set a Aside only 30 minutes for getting an answer to that question. The beauty of time boxing is that you're under this time pressure and that is to really work towards getting an answer to that question as quickly as possible. In other words, in that time frame. And because of that, you're going to be a lot more strategic and intentional about which resources you choose to consume and how you go about conducting your research. And the reason why this works so well is once you've hit that 30 minute mark, you're done. You no longer have the option to spend more time researching. And I can pretty much guarantee you that 30 minutes is more than enough enough time to get an answer to a question like this. And to be honest, also to the questions that you'll typically ask when you're learning a new topic. The best thing about this is because you've time boxed the research, the focus after this is then moving on to action. And the reason why this is powerful is because when you do something rather than doing nothing, that action breeds new information. And in the context of learning how to code, that's especially useful. Actually writing how to code will give you practical experience of a programming language. You'll actually go through the process of building software and learning flaws of that language. You'll put the theory to practice and understand why that particular language might be good in some cases and not good in others. The most important stage here is action. And what you want to do is get there as quickly as possible. And that's why time boxing is one of my favorite strategies and works so well for me. And I'm pretty sure it'll work well for you too. Because you've time boxed that research and discovery phase before you know it you're actually moving on to taking action which will breed new information and help you make better progress i hope you enjoyed this video and be sure to check out my other videos one of which talks about why i don't think junior developers should be using ai and even if you're not a junior developer it may be applicable to you too thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next one